that, believe me, they hate the blood of Christ. Amen. Thank you. If you have your Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter 6 with me this morning, please, in verse number 19. Hebrews chapter number 6 and verse number 19. In Hebrews 6, verse 19, the infallible text says, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. Our Lord Jesus Christ has many titles in the Word of God, folks. Many, many, many. Many different names make direct reference to the Son of the Living God, the Rose of Sharon, the Bright and Morning Star, the Lily of the Valley, the Alpha and the Omega. Amen, amen. And he, my friend, is the Savior of my soul, the one who keeps me and will deliver me one day in his presence, holy and unblameable. Here in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 6, he's called the Anchor. Note carefully, the scripture says that he is the anchor of the soul. In order to understand what that means, we need to go back about 2,000 years to the culture of his day, to the time when huge sailing ships went out to sea. They would not dare go out to sea without the anchor. But the anchor in those days, a lot of times it would be simply be a big stone. Sometimes the ship would have as many as six or seven huge stones aboard that ship, they became the anchor of the ship. When they pulled into port, they would have a huge stone buried there in the port, and the sailor would go ahead in a small boat, and that small boat would go up and find the huge stone, take a rope, tie it around that stone, and then the sailors on board the big craft would use the ropes to pull themselves slowly in to that huge anchoring stone. There they would have fixed themselves and be safe within the harbor because they were anchored to the stone. Our Lord Jesus Christ is that stone, folks. Make no mistake about it. And he being the anchor of the soul is the one who anchors you in this life and in the world to come. But an important part of that which is overlooked is the fact that the rope itself was so necessary to connect to that stone. That rope, my dear friend, if it weren't there, the stone would certainly be doing its job, but it wouldn't do any good for the ship whatsoever. So the rope had to be connected to the stone. The rope, the name of it, was an El Piece. An El Piece in Greek means hope. And so my friend, you make a direct connection between the rope of hope connected to the stone of salvation that pulls you into the anchor of safety. There, thank God, you can be safe before the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ has gone on to heaven. He's the rock of our salvation. And we have a rope that's attached to him that will pull us safely into the shore there in the presence of Almighty God, safe in the arms of Jesus. The Bible said the everlasting God is thy comfort. And he, my friend, is the one who will keep you on that day. So thanks be unto God that he is the anchor of my soul. And the rope, my friend, is my faith. My faith is in nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I'm connected to him by faith. And there he'll pull me safely into the sea, up, up over the sea in the wave. In 1 Timothy chapter number 1, verse 1, the Bible said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. First Peter chapter number one and verse three said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Nowhere in the word of God does it say that the Christian hopes that he's saved. No, 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 no. My hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ 
who is my hope, and my hope is that my blessed hope will appear one day and catch me up to meet him in the clouds and in the air. No, I'm not hoping that I'm saved. The Lord Jesus Christ gives me hope for tomorrow. He gives me hope in this life. He gives me hope for the future, and he is the anchor of my soul. He's the one that gives me reason for living. I'm here today because he's forever and ever and ever. And I'll be there because he still will be forever and ever and ever. And so the Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 10, having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. When it says, whither the forerunners first entered, even Jesus, he's made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. There at the right hand of the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ is that huge stone that anchors who you are. I hope you're attached to him today. By the rope of your faith, my friend, make note of this. That rope, when it is not seen, is when it's doing its job. Not when it's on board the ship, but when it's underneath the water connected to the huge stone. So I can't see my faith, but I sure know who it's connected to. It's like the blood that's over the doorpost and lintels. I can't see the blood, but my faith is in the blood and in what he's done for me at the cross at Calvary. Amen, amen, amen. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be with content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Isaiah chapter number 43 verse 2, which is a very, very, very passionate scripture for those who love it. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. What a blessed promise that is from God's eternal word. The anchor, my friend, therefore, anchors us in life. It anchors us in Christ, and it gives us a reason for why we are here. Hebrew, the book of, book of James, chapter number 1 and verse 8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all, he way, in all his ways. If Satan can get your mind off of the Lord Jesus Christ and who he is to you, he's already won the victory, and you're going down the wrong road to destruction. If you can look at your problems and look at the reversements, look at the world, look at the sadness of it, look at the death and dying around you, you're looking at the wrong place, and you will certainly go down. Lift your eyes to the heavens, to the one who came from the heavens. Anchor your soul in that rock, Connect yourself with him by faith and he will surely guide you through. Amen. Amen. In the book of Psalm chapter number four and verse one, hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me. When I was in distress, have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. The Lord will give us stability. He'll hear our prayer. The Bible said his ear is open to the prayer of the righteous. In the book of Psalm chapter 18 verse 36, Thou hast enlarged my steps under me, that my feet did not slip. Hallelujah. Amen. First Peter chapter number 1 and verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That means that when my faith wavers, that means that when I have times of doubt, that means that when I have bouts with sin, that means when I have problems that come in my life that I can't explain, that may seem to overwhelm me, he's still my God, he's still my Savior, he still protects me, he still keeps me, he will present me holy and unblameable in his sight one day. Hallelujah to God. Romans chapter number 14 verse eight said, for whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. Amen. Amen. The apostle said in Philippians 1.21, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Is that a reality in your life, or do you fear death? 
Is death a horrible enemy awaiting you at the end of this life? That you're not certain of where you're going? That you do not know what lies beyond the bar? There is something on the other side of the river. Well, I'll tell you this right now. I know the one that raised Lazarus from the dead. I know the one that raised my friend from the dead himself and ascended to the right hand of the Father. And I know the one who said to John in Revelation, I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, John, I'm alive forevermore and I've got the keys. I've got the keys of death and of hell. I know him. I know whom I have believed. Therefore, my friend, I will not fear what this world can do to me. Uh, many a believer has faced the storms of death, especially martyrdom. Polycarp lived in 155 AD. A Roman officer demanded for him to recant. And, the, and the, this old saint of God he was, a, he was a man of God, and here's what he said back to this Roman officer. Eighty and six years have I served him. He has done me no wrong. How can I revile my king that saved me? The Roman officer continued his threats. I'll throw you to the beast, he said. Polycarp told him to bring the beast on. The officer threatened again. Then I'll have you burned. Polycarp replied, you tried to frighten me with fire that burns for an hour. And you forget the fire of hell that never goes out. An hour later, his body smoldered in the ashes, but his soul was with his anchor, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Polycarp, I went to, when I went to Turkey, I went to Smyrna. I went to the very church that Polycarp was associated with. Of course, it wasn't the building today that was back then, but it was the location of the church at Smyrna. And I looked at the walls of the paintings of Polycarp, and I thought to myself, what a witness, what a testimony, what a, what a, what a message for us today from an old man that said, He's always been there for me. I'm not going to deny him now. Ignatius was such a one as that. He was the pastor of the church at Antioch for 40 years. He would not sacrifice to pagan practices, and he was hauled to Rome. It was there he was thrown to the lions in the Colosseum. Hear his words. He said, I would rather die for Christ than rule the whole earth. Christ was his anchor to the very end. Amen. Many of you have heard about Polycarp. Many of you have heard about Ignatius. You've heard about these saints of God. These are the ones that we call the church fathers. Some of them are apostolic, some post-Nicene, some anti-Nicene. They're the church fathers. They're those saints of God that went on before us and laid the foundation of the teachings that are in the church today. Men that we should revere and respect greatly. But can I bring you forward now, 2,000 years, to this day and to this age? to the very people that you've lived with, you know, not necessarily here in Knoxville, but they're contemporaries of you. They've lived in your time. Here's what one young lady said. Her name was Cassie Bernal. She was 17 year old, teenager. She'd been saved for only two years at Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado. It was April the 20th, 1999. Cassie was in the library studying her Bible as she did every day at lunchtime. Little did she know that morning that she would face one of the greatest tests of faith and courage that few Christians in the United States know anything about. Gunfire began to erupt in the school hallways and classrooms. The calm in the school turned into panic and pandemonium. One of the gunmen entered the library and Cassie reportedly knelt and prayed which angered the attacker. He approached her and asked her sarcastically if she believed in God. She paused, then said one word, yes. The gunman asked her why, but Cassie had no time to answer before she was shot to death and left in a pool of blood on the library floor. With her life on the line, Christ was her anchor, and she gave, and he gave her grace to stand up for her knowing it might cost her her life. My friend, if you were in Cassie's shoes, what would you do? The Bible says that the waters could overflow you. The waters are a powerful thing. In Isaiah chapter number 43, verse 2, listen carefully again. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. These are not empty words. On April the 20th, 1999, they were not empty words for Cassie Bernal. They were powerful words that she embraced as she looked off into eternity. And thanks be unto God, she was willing to say, yes, I'm a Christian. 
and the fear of death was removed from her. A gun staring her in the face could not change her faith. Her faith was real. This 17-year-old teenager probably had never had to be confronted by such a thing as this. I'm sure she hadn't. But when the time came, she was ready. Are you ready, my dear friend, if the time comes for you? The waters thou passeth through, the scripture says. Let me give you three of them. There's the flood of Noah, the waters of Jordan, and the Red Sea. The flood of Noah, these are the waters that brought judgment upon this world. No doubt in my mind that millions died because of the waters of Noah. But my dear friend, the same waters that destroyed the world lifted the ark. The same waters that killed, saved because the waters lifted them up above the judgment of God and carried them from the old world into the new world. My friend, I want you to understand today that the holy, holy, holy that I can walk in and pray before will destroy you in a heartbeat if you don't know him. When he comes back to this world, he's coming as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses my sin, but is a witness and a testimony against you if you don't know the Lord because the sacrifice that was made at the cross, what a marvelous, wondrous thing. Have you ever been to the waters of Noah? Can you hear them as they beat on the outside of the ark? Let us in, let us in, help us, let us in. Noah could not have let them in if he wanted to. He couldn't have done anything to that because the door had been shut. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ is the door. And by him you enter in. There is no other way. There is no other salvation. He's the bright and shining star. So the Bible says that there's the waters of Jordan. If the waters of Jordan is remarkable because the Bible says they went into the Jordan River when the priest had put his foot there. The moment he touched the Jordan River, it stopped flowing. The priest led them into the center of the Jordan River, and there they picked up 12 stones, and they carried them to the other side. But they also carried 12 stones with them and put them in the center of the Jordan River. It's an amazing thing. Something was taken out and something was put in. Have you gone through the waters yet where something is taken out and something is put in? Have you ever been through the waters where something in your life that didn't belong there was removed and then God put something in his place that was such a great blessing, amen? I've been there. I've had some of this stuff cut out and then I've had some good put in. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. I believe in sanctification. I believe if you're a true son of God, I believe if you've truly been born again, that the work God started in your life when he saved you, he will not cease until he completes it when he takes you from this world. And all that time he's fashioning the Lord Jesus in you. He's making less of you and more of him. The greatest witness you'll ever have in this world is not the words that come out of your mouth. It's not the show that you put on in front of people. The greatest witness you'll ever have in this world is when people see somebody bigger, better, greater than you in you. They realize that something's happened to you that's out of your control. They realize that some grace, miracle of grace, some work of grace has taken place inside your life. And that is a witness and a testimony to those who are watching. People are watching. People are listening. People are fed up with materialism. People are sick of religion. People want to, they want to find something real. People are looking all around them now. They're, they're experimenting with spiritual things. Why do you think there's such an interest today in ghosts and haunted houses and spiritism and seances and witchcraft and all this stuff? It's because that there's a move about in this country when people are getting sick and tired of the materialistic physical stuff that leaves you hanging dead. It does not satisfy that hunger in your soul, that big empty place in your heart that only God can replace. That, my dear friend, is what he wants to do for you. He wants them to see something somebody greater than you, somebody who is able to above and be, do above and beyond all that you could ask or think. And all that some people think a witness is, is the blather that comes out of their mouth. That's no witness. The witness is who you are and what kind of life you're living for the Lord Jesus. Then there's the Red Sea. My, I marvel at this. The waters that thou passeth through. They went through the Red Sea. What happened there, preacher? They went through, but Pharaoh couldn't go through. They went through a place 
that to them God had opened the door, made the way, prepared the land, and said, come on through. But when Pharaoh tried to go through the same thing, he was destroyed with his armies and stuck at the bottom. The Bible says that his wheels got stuck in the mud and Pharaoh could go no further. He died trying to do what the saved could only do. I've been to places that an unsaved man can't go. I've been bitten into places when he says to me, come, that an unsaved man can't go. I've been allowed to be in the presence of holy, 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 and been blessed of almighty God. And I know that I was being blessed, and an unsaved man cannot go. God has something for you if you're born again today that is above and beyond that all you could even ask or think. Your mind hasn't even even concede where he's able to take your soul to. Our problem is that we're satisfied with a mediocre, mediocre. We're satisfied with some kind of a Christian religion pumping its garbage out to us, and that's good enough for us. And all it is, folks, is garbage. If you want to walk with God, he'll walk with you. If you want to walk closer to him, he'll walk closer to him. If you want him, he'll give you him. If you want some spiritual something in your soul from God, he'll give you something spiritual in your soul from God. And my friend, he was able to defeat you to the point to where you can't imagine in this life it could ever happen. And it can happen, and it will happen if you want it to happen. If you want God, you can have him. Amen. But the unsaved have no idea. Here's a statement I read yesterday, and I thought, what a beautiful thing. Listen carefully. God does not open paths for us in advance of our coming. He does not promise help before help is needed. He does not remove obstacles out of our way before we reach them. Yet when we are on the edge of our need, God's hand is stretched out. Many people forget this and are forever worrying about difficulties which they foresee in the future. They expect that God is going to make the way plain and open before them, miles and miles ahead. Whereas he has promised to do it only step by step as they may need. You must get to the waters and into their floods before you can claim the promise. Many people dread death and lament that they have not dying grace. Of course they will not have dying grace when they are in good health, in the midst of life's duties, with death far in advance. Why should they have it then? Grace for duty is what you need, living grace, then dying grace when they come to die. Amen. That's wisdom. Here's another statement. God's presence in the trial is much better than exemption from the trial. The sympathy of his heart with us is sweeter far than the power of his hand for us. Amen. Psalm 119, 67 says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Have you ever been there? Yeah. You ever been there? You ever been there when God said, Son, I love you. Daughter, I love you. I want you to start living for me. I want you closer to me. Come on now. I'm not going to put up with this forever. Come back to me. Come back to home. Come back home, come home, come home, come home. You hear him and you make a little promise and you whisper under your breath and say, okay, I will, but when the time comes, I will. When I have the opportunity, I will. The opportunity never comes and you never make time. And so what happens? God afflicts you. Oh, he can afflict you. Believe me, God can get your attention. When the doctor walks into the hospital room and says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we can't do anything for you. Oh, we might be able to give you six months. We might be able to give you a year. You'll turn your face to the wall and you'll cry out to God and you'll say, Lord God, I want to live. Help me. And I'll tell you something about him. He's a good God. He's a gracious God. Oh, he can do for you what the doctor could never do for you. But has he got your attention yet? Has he got your attention yet? Has he been speaking to you and talking to your soul? Has he got your attention yet? Well, preacher, I've heard him, but you know what? I mean, this stuff happens to everybody. I mean, why you can't take every little thing that happens in your life and build some kind of doctrine on it and think it's God moving or God speaking? I'll tell you one thing. I'll tell you something right now. I don't believe as much as a hair of your head can be moved without God knowing it. Amen. I believe it. I believe God knows every step we take, every breath we breathe. I believe he knows every heart tick of our bodies. I believe he knows everything about us. And he talks to us in the secret parts. That's what we're talking about in Sunday school this morning, the secret parts. 
Sometimes you just get uncomfortable when it gets that close to God, doesn't it? When it gets down into the secret parts of your heart, where the heart begins to commune with God, it gets very uncomfortable because you know when that happens, it's going to take some stuff out of your life. But let me tell you something. Whatever he takes out of your life, he's going to replace it with something better. Amen. Do you believe him? Do you trust him? Do you think God's able to do that? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. April the 20th, 1999, age 17. Listen to this. Age 17. Rachel Joyce got a devout Christian first to be shot. Reportedly, she was eating lunch on the lawn outside the school when she was approached by the killers and asked if she believed in God. Knowing full well that the end result would be death, she said yes. She said yes become the title of a book about Rachel. Refusing to deny her faith in God, Rachel was shot in the head at point blank range. As part of the investigation, videotapes were found in which Eric Dylan and, and Eric and Dylan mocked Rachel for her faith. As horribly sad as this is, a precious life lost and a family left with a hole that cannot be filled. I cannot help but be proud of this young lady who in an instant went home to be with the Lord, whom she would not deny at 17 years of age. I got on her website and here's what it says about Rachel. Like all teenagers, Rachel struggled with doubts and frustrations. She expressed these along with some of her most inner thoughts and feelings in her journals. Sometimes she wrote them in the form of poems and letters. Sometimes she addressed them to God. Rachel was a girl who was friends with everyone. There wasn't a soul who wasn't important to her. She loved her family, her friends, and the Lord. Here's an entry in her journal. Quote, I want you to use me to reach the unreached, Rachel said to God. When she passed away in 1999, someone wrote here, and I think it's her mother, said in the years since her death, millions of people have come and continue to come to the Lord because of her legacy. A girl from Littleton, Colorado, who said yes to God every day, even in the face of death, a girl who wasn't afraid to stand up for what she believed in. A girl who wasn't afraid to be herself. A girl who was far above average. A girl named Rachel Joy Scott. I want to look her up as soon as I get to heaven. And I want to shake that little girl's hand. You know why? Her courage inspires me. Oh, does it ever. When I look at the church in America today, I am full of disgust. When I look at the lives of so many people, it does nothing but depress me. But when I read about a 17-year-old girl said, yes, yes, go ahead and shoot. Go ahead and shoot. Go ahead and shoot. Do you remember a few years ago up there in Lancaster, Pennsylvania? This crazed killer went into a one-room schoolhouse. He lined those little children up in that one-room schoolhouse. And there he went to set about to systematically murder every one of them. One little girl stepped out before he began killing, and this little girl said, shoot me first, shoot me first, hoping that if he killed her, that he would spare the rest of them in that room. I'll never forget the little girl that said, shoot me first. You want to meet her? Would you like to see her? Oh, I would like to see her, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah, I'd like to see the one that said, shoot me first. See, I'll never forget her. I'll never forget Cassie Bernal. I'll never forget Rachel Scott. I'll never forget these Christians who went on before us, who looked out into the face of death, and they looked out in faith because they had the anchor of their soul attached by that rope of faith, and nothing was going to break that. They knew where they were going. None of them thought that morning when they got up to go to school it would be the last day. None of those parents thought this would be the last time they saw their little girl alive. None of them had any idea that what a horrible, horrible, Horrible thing was about to happen that day, but God took the horror, horror and turned it into victory because he be they belong to him and he belongs to them. He is mine and I am his. You'll see them in heaven. You can be sure of this. God's martyrs have a special place in glory. The book of Revelation says, and I saw under the altar the souls of them that were beheaded for the word of God. He has a special place for his martyrs. And folks, let me say this to you this morning. That place is getting bigger. It's growing because the martyrs of the Lord Jesus Christ, my friend, are adding the number, a greater number than ever has been. 
Isaiah chapter number 43 verse 2 says, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. And I want to close with this this morning. This is one of the most inspiring things that I've ever read. My, how inspiring. There was a man by the name of Robert Morrison. He was the first Protestant missionary to China. When he was traveling at sea in a violent storm that almost sunk the ship, he cried out to God, and he read that scripture, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. He claimed God's promise. Morrison is the one who paved the way for missionaries to reach the Chinese for Christ. Now listen carefully. Even though he was only able to reach three or four converts in 25 years that he was in China, Morrison was used by God to translate the Bible, songbooks, gospel tracts from English into Chinese. He also prepared an Anglo-Chinese dictionary in a Chinese grammar book. He was used to make the tools that many others needed and used to do the work of the Lord. My, 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 if you judge the work of this missionary by the number of souls that they put on the board and they put in the newspapers and brag about being saved, he was an absolute and complete abject failure. But you see, my friend, God didn't send him over there to succeed. He sent him over there to be faithful. And in 25 years in China, to only have four or five people, that's not what he was there for. He was there to translate the Bible into the Chinese language. That's what he was there for. He was there because God put him there. He was doing what God told him to do. He was faithful to death in doing what God told him to do. And God was with him to the very end. Don't ever forget the name Robert Morrison. He was an Englishman. We'll meet him one day. And I believe, my friend, that a lot of Chinese people will say, thank you, Mr. Morrison, for translating the Bible into my language. What are you doing, my dear friend? Where did God plant you? What's he doing with you? Are you doing what God's called you to do? Are you in the place God put you? That's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to fashion your ministry after what somebody's put down in some newspaper and they brag about how many thousands of souls that got saved in their church and all, most of it is one, two, three, believe after me. No, that's not what you're here for. You're here to find the place of God in your life. This little 17-year-old girl that was sitting outside on the lawn bothering nobody became a witness. Her witness God used to save millions of people. Her witness lives on to this day. In my book, they don't get any better than Cassie Bernal and Rachel Scott. Remember those names. You'll meet them one day. 17 years old. Life cut short. Never had a husband. Never had children. Never had a family. God took them straight from here and let them walk down streets of pure, transparent gold. He said, I've got something I want you to see. You paid the ultimate price. You were faithful unto death. Now here is a crown of life, and this is your heaven. And may it be for all of us today if we know the Lord. God grant us that we stay faithful and true to the end, for the Lord Jesus comes back to get us. Dear friend, are you ready? Are you ready? Do you know where you're going? 200 and what was it, people? 60, 224 people shot out of the sky over, over Egypt, most of them Russians. And there's one picture of a little boy standing inside the terminal. This little boy, no bigger than this, he's looking out the window, and you can see the jet aircraft out there past him. And here this little boy, that little boy boarded, boarded that airplane, and that little boy died when they shot that thing out of the sky. Those murdering Muslims killed them. Now remember something, remember this good. The Koran, that's their holy Bible, tells them to kill you. Don't ever let any politician or religious leader tell you otherwise. And it's not going to stop until you stop them. Now that's the bottom line. That's the fact of the matter. Aren't you glad for a God that can take an axe murderess and save her? Who are you talking about, preacher? An axe murderess. How many of you remember when George W. Bush went in office as the president? 
How many of you remember that locked up down there in the state of Texas was a young woman who had taken an axe and murdered somebody with that axe because she was high on methamphetamines. Her name was Carla Faye Tucker. All across the country, preachers tried to get her a reprieve or tried to get her to, to reduce the death sentence to life imprisonment, and they wouldn't do it. They have done for many, but they wouldn't do it for her. And so when her end came there in the prison, she faced it with joy in her heart and a smile on her face. And Carla Faye Tucker, that had one time been an axe murderess, now is a saint of God down the streets of gold with Cassie and with Rachel. And you can go down the same streets with them if you want to. Would you like to do that? Okay, would you like to walk down the streets of pure gold? Would you like to be in heaven with the Lord? Would you like to know that your sins are forgiven? Would you like to know that regardless of what happens to you, you may go screaming mad in your mind, but if you've ever been born again, it'll be forever and ever and ever and ever. Hallelujah to God. I want to meet Carla Faye Tucker too. I want to meet them. I want to meet Robert Morrison, Adoniram Judson. On the list to go, I want to meet them. I want to meet Dale Moody. I'd like to meet Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I want to meet them. I want to meet them by the grace of God. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up in Jesus' name. Father, bless the preaching of your word. May it help some soul in this house. May it reach somebody for the glory of God. And I'll bless you and praise you and exalt you and glorify you forever. You've been good to me, Lord. You've given me many, 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 many more years in this world than those two 17-year-old teenagers that left this world. But my heavenly Father, no truer, better, sweeter life could be lived than the 17 years that they lived and the testimony that they left behind and the witness of what they were and who they are. In thy holy name we pray, Lord Jesus, and for Jesus' sake we ask it. Amen. Amen. What do we got, brother? Page 61 in your All-American Church hymnal. 61. <clears throat>